Well, turn in your Bible to Psalm 3. Psalm 3. Psalm 3. So we've been studying the Psalms here on Wednesday nights recently in the last several weeks. Psalm 3. Psalm 3. We're going to read the eight verses of Psalm 3. Psalm 3, starting in verse 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. This psalm, David wrote this psalm when he was fleeing from Absalom, his son, or he either wrote it while he was fleeing or he was writing it in retrospect, but it's, it's written as if it's during that time that he is uh, fleeing, or perhaps he's in the wilderness, um, perhaps he's in the wilderness in the midst of fleeing from Absalom, and he's got some time on his hands, and he's, he's hiding, he's running for his life, and uh, he is... He is then uh, just writing this down, and, and David was one who was inspired of the Lord to write these things that were just deep down in his heart. And so let's, ref let's go back to that account, 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15, this is the account of Solomon attempting to take, uh, not Solomon, Absalom. Uh, Absalom, as he's fleeing from Absalom, Absalom's trying to take the throne from David. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we begin reading at verse 1. 2 Samuel 15 and verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And, Israel, and Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed, deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So this was a long process that uh, Absalom took. In the, uh, his, uh, his process of stealing the hearts of the men of Israel was a long one. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord, unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And so David is, basically he decides we need to get out of here because the, he saw the people's hearts were turned after Absalom. The people's hearts were uh, not going to be as supportive of David. And so they had to, uh, he had to get out of here. Uh, lest any evil would come upon them and the city would be destroyed. And so this is the, 
the context. This is how the, the psalm was written or what, what was going on in his life at the time the psalm was written. And so David's pouring his heart out here. So let's look at a few things from this psalm. First of all, in verse 1, we see David's complaint. David's complaint. He says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Maybe, you, maybe you've felt that way before. How they are increased that trouble me. It seems as if there's just people that are causing me trouble and problems and opposition uh, more and more. Many are they that rise up against me. Now, maybe we can identify with that more as a Christian. That maybe in America, there's more and more people that rise up or rising up against Christians, rising up against Jesus, rising up against the God of the Bible. Maybe we can feel that way. Or maybe there's something in our very immediate uh, proximity that uh, maybe it's at work, maybe it's in family life, uh, maybe it's in a, a number of cases that we feel like there's, there's people just rising up against me. There's many rising up uh, that are in opposition to me. So David is, is giving his complaint to the Lord. He cried out to God with the reality of the situation. He's realized this, this is reality. I mean, this wasn't, he wasn't making this up. He wasn't exaggerating. He was telling the truth here when he was calling out to the Lord and uh, letting his, his trouble be made, known, be made known unto the Lord. But that leads us to the second thing, David's discouragers. In verse 2, he says, Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. So there are those, not just those that rise up and trouble him, not just those that, uh, that are rising up against him, but there are those which say of my soul, talking about his own life, there is no help for you in God. And so these aren't just people that are against him, they are actually discouraging him. They're actually speaking against God. Well, uh, and, and, and I've seen these comments that people make uh, when, say, a, um, something bad, maybe a, a someone who's a professing Christian, they'll get killed and it makes the news and something will happen. And, uh, and basically, well, you know, well, your Jesus apparently wasn't good enough or couldn't save you or uh, your God couldn't help you in this situation. And there are people who have made those comments, who have had that kind of an attitude. And so even for those uh, who are living and those who are facing these problems, there may be people who just, they doubt in God's ability. And many times those are people who don't know the Lord to begin with. And, and so they will, they'll see the trouble that a Christian goes through, someone who is a true believer in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and they will then look at that as a chance to pile on. They'll look at that as a chance to be a discourager and, and being a naysayer. And so here with David, there were many naysayers that doubted God's protection. And once again... Uh, now, he says, many there be which say of my soul, but we see an actual account of this as David was running from Absalom. And turn back, to keep your finger there in Psalm 3, but 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 5. Second Samuel 16 and verse 5 says, And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, and he, he came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men which were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. And then, uh, So then uh, Abishai, was, uh, who was uh, uh, one of David's men, he says, Why should this dead dog curse the Lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. <laughs> that was the uh, Abishai, just like his uh, brother uh, Joab, they were just some pretty hard-nosed guys. They didn't mess around. And uh, so here Abishai calls him a dead dog, and he says, let me take off his head. I'll take care of this problem for you. And in verse 10, the king, and the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? 
And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Uh, this is Shimei uh, fellow. He was, uh, came across as a pretty bitter man holding some things against David. Of course, David took the throne uh, after Saul was, was killed and Jonathan was killed. And God had said David was going to have the throne. It was not going to stay in Saul's family. Uh, but Shimei, who was a relative of Saul, he was of the house of Saul, uh, he was apparently still holding things against David and trying to bring up the past against David and trying to uh, uh, be uh, condemning to David and trying to discourage him. But David had a, a good response here. He says, you know, well, maybe he says the Lord hath bidden him. The Lord's the one who's allowing him to do this. And, and, and I think David looked at this as an opportunity for him to humble himself and to keep him humble. If he was a prideful in this moment, uh, he would have had uh, Abishai take off his head, uh, take off Shimei's head. But David, in his humility, he recognized, well, maybe the Lord has him doing this for a reason. And, you know, maybe the Lord will, will you know, he'll see this. He'll, uh, and he'll look on my affliction and will give me some good based on what he's doing to me. And so a very good response when faced with this naysayer and faced with this, this tremendous criticizing person of uh, this, this mocker. And, uh, and this was the Shimei. And so he was, he was one of them. Now David says in Psalm 3 and verse 2, there were many, there were many who were saying to him uh, that, that, you know, that there's no help for him in God. But, uh, and by the way, Shimei did face his uh, justice when, uh, after uh, Solomon took the throne. And uh, he, he faced, he had his day, and uh, it, it didn't go well for him. But... Uh, but at that moment, David was facing this one who was trying to discourage him and tear him down. And uh, I, I think about in 2 Samuel 16, I noticed there, And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. And so uh, rather than focusing on the naysayer, focusing on the, the mocker, uh, the, uh, the scorner, uh, David and his people, they went to a spot, a place of refreshment. And that's what we need to do when we're faced with the uh, discouragements faced with the mocking, the scorning, uh, faced with just a society, maybe it's a society, maybe it's individuals who are opposing us, who are against our faith, who are against the Bible, who are against the Lord. Uh, we need to go to that place of refreshment, not get too dwelling on uh, those people, but to go to look to a place of refreshment. And that's what David and his men did, those people that were with him. And so David had his discouragers. That's the second thing here in Psalm 3. Number three, we see David's recognition. David's recognition, he says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. He says, But thou, O Lord. And, and you've got to love, this is a good kind of but. He's giving his complaint in verse 1, and that complaint really goes into verse 2 with talking about his discouragers, those that are naysayers, those that are doubting God's protection. But then he goes into his recognition when he says, But thou, O Lord. And any time we face a discouragement or face naysayers, face maybe doubting the Lord or those who are trying to get us to doubt the Lord, maybe circumstances try to get us to doubt the Lord, we need to go back and look to the Lord. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. He recognized who God is. You're my shield. You're my protector. You're the one who has gotten me all this way. You're the one who's protected me up to this point. And uh, you're my glory. You're the one who, who brings me honor. And, uh, and the lifter up of mine head. Not, uh, David uh, looked to God as, as one that he would honor. David honored the Lord. And the lifter up of mine head. What's, what's the lifter of my, up of mine head? Well, when someone's discouraged, that is, you know, their head is down. They're, they're of a, a sad countenance, a, a poor countenance, and a discouraged countenance. But he says, you're the lifter up of mine head. You're the one who keeps my chin up. You're the one who... Uh, elevates me. You're the one who honors me with these blessings and these things that you've done in my life. Uh, he's, he's looking to the Lord. He's, he's recognizing that uh, you know, these discouragers, the naysayers, the mockers, the doubters, 
they were not to be listened to, but he's recognizing God. He's turning his attention to God, and that's what we should do when there is a, uh, a dis time of discouragement and doubt in our life. It's David's recognition. In number four, verses four through six, we see David's testimony. David's testimony. Verse four, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And he heard me out of his holy hill. Now his holy hill as Zion. Zion is the holy hill. And God heard his cry. I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me. So here is the, here's his testimony. And you know what? We should have this testimony as well. And I hope we do in our lives. That there were times that we've cried to the Lord. We've prayed to the Lord. We've had these burdens. We've had these different situations. And the Lord has heard us. The Lord has heard us. It's a wonderful thing. We can cry to the Lord and the Lord hears us. God heard his cry. Notice verse 5. I like verse 5 here. I laid me down and slept. I just love the way this fits in here, the significance of this verse. I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. Now the first part of this verse, I laid me down and slept. In other words, even in the midst of his problems, even in the midst of his discouragement, even in the midst of all the enemies and opposition, those that are rising up against him, apparently David was able to lay down and sleep. He was able to lie down and have a good night of rest, even in the midst of his opposition, even in the midst of the, maybe the fear or the, the uh, temptation to be fearful, uh, maybe in the midst of of facing these people who were discouraging him, who were doubting God's protection or trying to make him doubt God's protection. He says, I laid me down and slept. So here's, a, here's someone who's running for his life. And yet he's able to lay down and sleep. And you know, there's a lot of people who have problems sleeping because they're so consumed with anxiety and fear and doubt that they cannot lay down at night, even lay down at night, and have peace enough to sleep. But David could even when his life was in danger. He said, I laid me down and slept. And so some, some now there's some people, their head hits the pillow and they don't have any problems going to sleep. You know, they're just, they put in a hard day and their head hits the pillow. But you know, there's a lot of people who are f consumed with fears and discouragement and anxiety and pressure, and it'll just keep them from sleeping. They just can't, cannot relax enough to go to sleep. And so, you know, the world would look at that as well. You know, you just have a, you just have a, a sleeping, um, you know, some, some sleeping problem, you know, medical sleeping problem. And, you know, there are some people who have physical things that happen to them, maybe with their uh, hormonal, uh, maybe hormonal issues that are that are influenced by various factors, some of which is also stress and anxiety that, that might prevent them from sleeping. You know, there's, there's different hormones that get released at different times, or at least supposed to get released at different times to help us sleep. So sometimes that might be lifestyle issues that, that keep us from sleeping. But there are many who just simply have a hard time sleeping because they are fearful and they're anxious. And so David, he didn't have this problem. He said, I laid me down and slept. But then he said, I awaked. So in other words, he was okay all night long. He was okay for that whole period of time, when he, however long it was that he slept. I awaked. So he didn't die in his sleep. He didn't uh, get killed by the enemy. He says, I awaked for the Lord sustained me. Now there's times I can't sleep if I feel like I've, left the door unlocked. So when I get up and I unlock the door, and I go, or I get up and I should say I go lock the door, at least make sure it's locked. You know what, then okay, well, I've done my part. I've, I've locked the doors, make sure the windows are closed and locked up. And you know what, we're in the Lord's hands. I have to trust the Lord for safety. And, and that's what David was doing. He says, I awaked I mean, and nothing happened at night. He had reason to be fearful. He had reason to not sleep. He could have stayed up all night. But, you know, there's times when God wants us to sleep so that it actually is refreshing to our mind and to our bodies 
so that we'll be able to face our fears and we'll be able to face the discouragement, be able to face the oppositions and be able to more trust in the Lord. I have found personally that when I am sleep deprived, I think my wife has said this too, that uh, being sleep deprived, everything looks worse when you're tired. Everything looks worse when you're tired. I mean, just things, things that you'd normally be able to handle just seem so overwhelming. And maybe they're so overwhelming, you get more snappy, you get more grumpy, you get more uh, upset with people that you normally, you figure, why is this person acting this way? Well, they're just sleep deprived. And so one of the things that fear will do to us is it'll, uh, it'll uh, in discouragements, they'll keep us awake in these anxieties. And then the being kept awake, we don't get the sleep we need, and then it turns into a bad spiral. But we need to give things into the Lord's hands, look at Him, look at Him as our sustainer. He says, for the Lord sustained me. In other words, He's the one who kept me going. He's the one who kept me alive. He's the one who protected me. Albert Barnes says, still safe and secure. He had not been suddenly attacked by his foes and made to sleep the sleep of death. He had not been crushed by anguish of spirit, that we are awaked in the morning after a night's refreshing slumber, that we are raised up again to the enjoyments of life, that we are permitted again to greet our friends and to unite with them in the privileges of devotion, should always be regarded as a new proof of the goodness of God and should lead to acts of praise. We have no power to awake ourselves. And when we remember how many are taken away from our world each night, how many there are who lie down to sleep to wake no more, we should never rise from a bed of repose without giving our first thoughts in gratitude to our great preserver. I like those thoughts from this commentator, Albert Barnes. You know, even with the majority bearing down on him, look at verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. So, I mean, this is the majority. At this point in time, he was in the minority. That's why he had to flee, because people's hearts were uh, going after Absalom. And they followed after Absalom, and, and they were convinced, they were swayed in that direction, so David didn't have the majority with him. But yet he still did not fear. He makes this declaration, or his, sorry, his testimony is, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. He's surrounded. He, he feels like he's, you know, there's, he's in the minority. He's in the minority, and he's got all these around him. And there were thousands and thousands that were pursuing him. There were many. But he did not fear. He did not fear. He says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. So that number, that was David's testimony. And then number five, David's cry to God, verse seven, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And David's recognizing, you know, God had delivered him in the past. He defeated his enemies in the past, and he's asking him to do it again. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. You know, and, and arising, that's kind of a, from a human perspective. It'd be kind of like a person sitting in the chair not doing anything, and then all of a sudden they rise up and they spring into action. And that's, that's a, to our benefit that we can picture that of, He's asking God to arise. He's saying, arise, O oh God. Instead of God sitting back, letting all this thing, these things happen and seemingly not intervening or not directly intervening at this point uh, as, as far as total deliverance, now David's asking, he's crying out to God for salvation, for deliverance in recognition of the deliverance God has already given him. And you know, it's not just spiritual, I'm sorry, it's not just physical deliverance that people need at times. And David was asking for physical deliverance, but you know there's a good picture here of spiritual deliverance that we need, that every person needs. Every person needs God's salvation. Every person needs to be born again. And that is what it takes for a person to be saved, is to recognize their condition. They need to recognize the trouble they're in, just like David recognized the trouble he was in. But spiritually, people need to recognize their trouble, the trouble they're in because of sin. And then recognize that God is the one who is the only one who can help them with that. And then cry out to God for 
salvation. God, would you please save me from my sins? Would you please forgive me? Would you please deliver me? David's cry to God. Then we see David's declaration in verse 8. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And, and it's also a recognition, spiritually speaking, God is the only one who can save. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Talking about being born again, spiritual salvation. It's only through Jesus Christ. And here, as far as his physical deliverance, he recognized it was only the Lord that could save him. It wasn't any human being that was going to get out of this mess. Now, God uses human beings. He works through human beings, but oftentimes... Uh, you know, you can tell that it is God supernaturally working when God steps in and supernaturally does something. And that's, that's what he did in David's life in, uh, in, in protecting him from Absalom and delivering him from Absalom and his, uh, those other enemies. His declaration, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Thy blessing is upon thy people. So he's recognizing those who truly belong to God, those who are God's, God's blessing was, is upon them. God's not going to neglect them. God's not going to uh, not deliver them. There will be salvation. There will be deliverance. And it only comes from the Lord. And his blessing is upon them. His blessing is upon his people. And you know what? I think of the same thing today. God's people today those who are saved, those who are in Christ, have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, God's blessing is upon His people even when it seems, you know, the majority is against God. The majority is, uh, has a hostility to the Lord and the things of God's Word and is not interested in the gospel. Even when that is the case, God's blessing is still on his people. He's still watching out for his people. We don't have to fear. We don't have to back down. We don't have to uh, be discouraged. We don't have to listen to the naysayers and those who doubt God's protection. Maybe those who mock and say, well, there's no protection of the Lord now. The you know, I think about it this way. It just comes to mind is the whole idea of, you know, different governments are trying weather modification. And uh, that's been going on for a number of years, and they do try to modify the weather. But, you know, you, do you really have to modify the weather, or at least attempt to modify the weather, if you believe there's a creator God whose hand is over all things? You wouldn't have to modify the weather. You wouldn't feel the need to modify the weather. It'd be a matter of trusting in the Lord that He's going to have His hand in what the weather is going to be. And so that's, that's one way where we, we see the evidences of just a lack of a trust in God for His provision, His protection, and His help. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And with David... I gave you the example of Shimei. You know, he was one who was mocking David and coming down on him. And you know, at the time, David said, no, we're not going to lash out at him. We're not going to do anything back to him. But his, Shimei's judgment day came in the days of Solomon. And so, so it will be with the naysayers today, with the discouragers today, those who are against the Lord today, those who doubt his protection today, there will come a day of judgment. Justice will be served. But we need to continue on trusting in the Lord's protection and the Lord's provision. Keep following the Lord. Keep recognizing salvation belongeth unto the Lord. He's the one who delivers. He's the one who blesses. He's the one who provides and is the shield. Psalm 3, David, fleeing from Absalom his son, recognizes that God is the one who protects him, and God is the one who protect you and me. We just need to trust him, keep on looking to him, recognizing salvation comes from the Lord. Let's